welcome to the College and Career Ready Podcast, your go-to resource for all things related to preparing our students for success in their college and career journey. My name is Sonia Cacique, and I will be your host and guide on this exciting journey towards a bright future. Our mission is simple, to empower our parents and students by elevating their confidence and resourcefulness. We believe that you deserve all the tools and support necessary to open the doors to endless possibilities of success. And with our community, you don't have to do this alone. So come with me and let's get started. Being a physician associate or a physician assistant can be a remarkable career, one that unfortunately is underrepresented by minority. Welcome to the College and Career Ready podcast. I'm your host, Sonia Cacique. Today is your opportunity to hear firsthand from a Latina who is making strides in this honorable field. Paola Gonzalez is a bilingual clinical provider for over 19 years. She has spent the last 17 years of her career working at MD Anderson in Houston, Texas. With her, we will explore the career as a physician associate or physician assistant her career journey, and the many opportunities available within this profession. Today, she will share with us her career journey, having arrived to the States at the age of nine, speaking only Spanish, and how, thanks to a physics teacher, was introduced to the career as a physician associate, changing the trajectory of her life. Not only will you get to explore what the career of a PA entails, but we will also share what PA schools are looking for in applicants, as well as organizations that are out there to support you along the way. Join us as we explore this career together. So without further ado, let's get started. Welcome, Paola. Welcome to the College and Career Ready podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to to really have this conversation with you. Um, So before we get started, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience, a little bit about yourself, your family, where you're at in your career right now. Awesome. Yes. So my name is Paola Gonzalez. I am a physician assistant. I have been working in this career for the past 20 years, essentially. And I live here in Houston uh, since 2007 when I came to work at MD Anderson, but originally I'm from Colombia. I came to the States, lived in New York. That's where I went to PA school, but hated the cold. I needed to get south. <laughs> yeah, so I have my twins um, that are nine years old and definitely bilingual. And I love that about them, that we really focus on learning Spanish and English. So it's been a good experience overall. Very, very cool. And, you know, let me ask you this. Um, how old were you when you when you came to the States? So I came to the States when I was nine and a half, so almost the same age as my kids are now. And I wow. didn't know a word of English, like nothing. So it was definitely a shock to me, like obviously entering school and like going into ESL. And like there was at least 20 of us, but none of them, like we didn't all speak Spanish. We were a hodgepodge of languages with one ESL speaker. So wow. it was quite a week of a, a change. Yeah, no, absolutely. Tell me, let's let's go into that that time frame. Um, your early education years. Did you know what you wanted to do when you grow up? Um, what was your thought then? So I think ever since I was little, I think I knew I was going to be in some form of healthcare. My my mom and my dad always said that whenever anybody like skinned their knee or there was a cut or something like that, like I was first in line looking, like what how can I help? Like I didn't yeah. know anything. I was there. So I was not the squimish person at all. And so it kind of always kind of stayed with me. And when I came to the U.S., the big focus was you you came to the state so you could have a better opportunity for education and that you could have a better career. So although in Colombia, we have a lot of very educated people, the job uh, opportunities are not as big just because our economy is not as big as the U.S. And so, yeah, you can be a doctor in Colombia, but there's not always the opportunity to be successful sometimes, unfortunately. So I came to the U.S. and I started school. Um, I was the only one really going to school at the time in my family. Everybody just came and started working essentially to mm. kind of make it happen. And so it was a lot of me just really focusing on learning 
English and helping myself with own homework because like there wasn't like the mom and dad at home helping with, with homework or trying to figure out how to get assignments done and stuff like that in a language I didn't understand. So it definitely um, took a lot of effort, but I knew that it was something that I really kind of kept in the back of my mind. I loved art. That was kind of like my other one. It was like the science brain and the art brain. So I've always liked design and decor and colors and art. I mean, I in high school, I finished a lot of my prereqs early enough to graduate that it left a lot of freedom for me to take extracurricular classes that were not in the core. And so for me, it was taking painting, it was taking 2D art, it was taking graphic arts. And so I took like a significant amount of art classes. I did a mural at my school, actually, at my high school with a friend of mine. Oh, wow. Um, it was kind of what's funny because when it came time to graduate and it's like you have to make a decision like do you go down the art path or do you go down the science path and for me I kind of made it into a more rational thought process is that science will always pay the bills yeah <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> it's a good thing I still liked it and so I actually started as pre-med mm-hmm. and I applied to, to school for pre-med and it was my physics teacher at the time in 11th grade that said hey have you heard of this PA profession and I'm like no what is that I mean it's like it's it's a medical profession that gives you a whole lot more flexibility and you're able to go into different specialties and you get a little bit more work-life balance and I'm like well that sounds kind of interesting let me look at into some more so I did apply actually to a PA school down in Florida called Nova Southeastern in Fort Lauderdale and I got in and then I had also gotten in into George Washington University for their pre-med program so that's like what do I do? Like, do I do pre-med? Do I do PA? And it came down to finances. Honestly, like, yeah, I'm being first generation immigrant. I didn't have a college fund. Like there wasn't these extra funds to pay for school. It was community college or whatever scholarships you got. And I think that's what pushed me so hard in school to do well in high school and to get the good grades because that was my out, right? That was my way to get my education. And so it turned out that George Washington University gave me the better package. Mm. Um, between scholarships and grants and student loans. It wasn't everything. It didn't cover all the fees and all the funds. And so um, I decided for that school because my best friend had also gotten accepted and we thought we'll just room together. You know, it'll be our first time moving away from home essentially and go from there. But I was working about 30 hours a week still just to supplement Mm -hmm. the difference of what wasn't covered. And I was still also taking about 17 credit hours a semester. And that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And I just, I couldn't see the long-term success of that just because I was going to burn out. And so I decided to go back home after my first freshman year of college, go back to New York and refresh and reset. And so I moved in with a friend. We got an apartment. I went back to work full time and I went back to community college and started doing my prereqs, doing everything that I needed to do to get into PA school again, because I thought I definitely want to stay in healthcare and I think PA will be a better venue for me. And so that's what I did. I did all my prereqs. And in 2000, I was able to get into PA school in New York. Hi, friend. Before we dive back into today's engaging discussion, we have an exciting announcement to make. Are you eager to stay up to date with the latest college and career ready news, insightful blogs, and gain early access to the following week's episode topic? Well, we've got just the thing for you. I'm thrilled to introduce our College and Career Ready newsletter. By joining our community, you'll be part of a vibrant group of parents and students with aspirations of being college and career ready. Plus, you'll get exclusive access to all the valuable resources we have to offer. So, how do you join? It's simple. Just head over to collegecareerready.org, all one word, collegecareerready.org, and navigate to the resource tab. There you'll find a sign up link to our newsletter. It's quick and easy to join. And it's the best way to stay connected with us and elevate your college and career journey. Join us today at collegecareerready.org and click on the resource tab where you can sign up to our newsletter. We can't wait to welcome you into our community. Thank you for being part of our podcast family. And now back to the show. That is amazing. I'm going to come back to to that part of your life in just a minute. I want to go back because there's something, there's several things that you said very important that I want our students and our parent listeners to to listen to this. 
English was not your predominant language at home. And now in our generation of parents, we want to be so actively involved and we want to monitor every little opportunity in their education. Yet when you were growing up, it was just you motivating yourself, right? Growing up, like my dad, single parent working and trying to take care of the family and stuff like that, because we have my grandparents living with a typical Latino family, right? You have the grandparents and uncles living all in one roof. But he like stopped going to the parent teacher conferences. He's like, why do I need to go? You're always getting good grades. Like, I don't need to go there and listen to that. Like, I see your report card. And it was, again, less of that parent oversight. He just trusted me that I had to do what I had to do. And he didn't go. Um, which is so different, you're right, than what it is now with my own kids. Yeah, than how we are. But it also it also reassures us that when the foundation is there, when the parents set the foundation with their students for them to be successful, they're going to be successful. And um, you did mention financial struggles and, and having to really pay yourself through. And I love also that you were honest and shared that you had to stop, look back and reset. And I think sometimes we're so afraid of starting over or readjusting our plan, especially A-type personalities. But now looking back, I think you've accomplished a lot and you got into an amazing program. So now we're fast forwarding back to you going into PA school. Tell us a little bit about that experience. What all does PA school usually cover and a little bit more about the job description? It's definitely changed over time. So when I went uh, back in 2000, (laughs) you know, there was a lot more second career students there. I still remember being the only one that was truly coming in from high school, prereqs, just right into the program. There was a lot more science teachers there. There was a lot of business people that were there, just people that were just starting over. And our program that I got into at Toro College was the first starting program at that particular hospital, which was Winthrop Hospital in Long Island. And so we were the guinea pigs in a way for that program. They had other programs in other parts of this of the area of New York, but not at that hospital. And so it was unique in that we would all sit together in the same classroom. We were just the whole time basically Side by side, all day, starting 8 a.m. in the morning until like 8 p.m. sometimes. And the teachers would just come in, teach, and leave. And we would sit at the same chairs. Like there wasn't changes from one campus to another. We were a commuter college, essentially. So we had our room there. But our teachers would come to us, and then they would leave. And we would get like an hour break for lunch. But it went through. Like there was no summer breaks. There was, yes, a spring break and a winter break. But It was year-round school, Monday through Friday, from 8 to around 7 p.m. And we saw everything from anatomy, physiology, cardiology, all the different subspecialties. It's a full year didactic that we saw and that you're obviously tested in to make sure that you've got all that basis. And then the second year, again, this is 2000, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Clinical rotations. So you would go on four to five week clinical rotations in different specialties. Like my first one was internal medicine, and then you went pediatrics, and then surgery, and then OB. And so you go through all the different specialties, and you get signed off on procedures. Like I had to do three of everything: three deliveries, three lacerations, three EKGs. It was always kind of like we need to know that you can at least do three of these, and that they have to be signed off by the preceptor that you have. And then at the end, when you graduate you do have to take a national certification exam, make sure that you are capable to know all the knowledge you need to be, to be certified in the profession so that you can then get licensed to Mm -hmm. work as a provider. And then the license vary per state. And then you do have to be certified ever so often. So in the beginning, it was every two years, and then it was every six years, and now it's every 10 years, same as physicians. So we all every 10 years, essentially. Yeah, very good. So for someone who is completely new to this, okay, so let's say someone is exploring going to medical school or wants to be in the practicing side of healthcare. Can you explain to us or elaborate a little bit more the role of a PA? Absolutely. So PAs essentially collaborate with physicians. We are not medical assistants. We're not there to essentially pass over instruments or write down your notes. It's, I think, a big misconception in 
big um, title issue that people hear physician assistants and think medical assistants, and that's mm-hmm. not. So what we do is because we are taught alongside many times physicians, we learn the medical model of patient care. And so we are able to see a patient, evaluate them, examine them, and diagnose them with a disease process, as well as prescribe them the medication or treatments that they need. So if I see someone that comes in before I worked in oncology or worked in primary care, they would come in and they would see me for their high blood pressure and their diabetes and their upper respiratory infections. And I would see as young as babies to as elderly as 80, 90 years of age. And I would have my own panel of patients that I would see alongside with my physician. They would have their own panel as well. The nice variety of what we do is that we we know our limitations and we know that when we have a complicated case or we've tried a couple of different techniques and or different medications and we're just not seeing the response that we would expect to see based on how we were taught, we can go next door to our doctor and be like, hey, Dr. So-and-so, like I'm seeing this patient, I've done A, X, Y, and Z and it's not working. What are your thoughts? What can we do? Do you think we can change something? And so we can collaborate and work together and come up with a new treatment plan. But at the same time, like if it's something more complex that I feel like, you know what, this patient really needs the intricacies of a physician, mm-hmm. I can also collaborate and understand, you know what, as the bar is like, I think you should go see Dr. Shaw today because this is complex enough that I feel we can work as a team together and get you better. But I think he might do better for you. So I think it's a great way to understand that. Um, we assist in surgery. So I've done first assist and we work in the OR alongside the physicians working on different uh, surgical protocols. We also work in research. I have a good friend of mine that loves to do research and has done a lot of presentations worldwide. I think she was just recently in Japan presenting about her liver surgery uh, research studies that she's done with her surgeon that she works with. So I think it gives a lot of variety in what we can do, but also understanding our limitations that we're not going to be freestanding providers working in our own practice, um, that we're always going to be working alongside a physician. And that's what I love, the the whole team-based method that we practice in. I love that. I absolutely love that. And thank you for explaining that, because I think there is a a definitely misconception, especially in in our Latino community between the difference between a PA and a physician and, and also thinking that a PA is a medical assistant, um, Mm -hmm. or, or sometimes even a nurse. And it's Mm -hmm. beyond that, because like you said, um, you get to prescribe, you have your own patients that you have to see. Thank you for bringing light into, um, into this career. So you explained to us, you know, you graduated in, in 2000, um, how has it changed now as far as education? So if somebody's interested in considering becoming a PA, what are, what are they looking at now? So how it's evolved is that originally when this profession started um, out in Duke, it was a certificate program. And then it evolved into an associate's program. Um, and it kept on expanding. When I went, my school was working on going from a bachelor's program into a master's program. And so Funny enough, my class did all the work that would be expected of a master's degree program, and they were working on the accreditation for that. And so we graduated, and the following year, it got accredited. The following year is when they moved over to master's degree. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much the standard now. So most P- most PA students have to have a bachelor's degree, um, have to have all the prereqs um, that are required, which are typical out of science-based Uh, prerequisites that they request, which is kind of what I went through as well when I did my prereqs. Um, And then they go in for a master's program. And in their master's program, same thing they have, depending on the program they go to, it can be a year to 18 months of didactical, and then the same thing, another year of clinical rotations and practice. Um, And then they, again, they, they do have a few more things where they have to do like PASPA, uh, applications and they have they prefer them to have a patient experience or exposure. I already had that because when I was working full time as I was working for my prereqs, I actually worked as a physical therapy assistant. So that was my patient contact. Those were my, and I did medical assistant for an OBGYN on a weekend job. Like I was just again make ends meet, make it happen, make it yes. work. And just you know, you grind. Um, and so that gave me more patient experience. 
and then I think also having that physical therapy background help because now when I'm seeing patients for their low back pain or something like that, like I'm like, oh, when I was in physical therapy, like we did these exercises, stretching, and that's not my specialty, but I still remember a lot of that stuff. So I think there is a good valid point in anyone considering this profession that they try to find some kind of experience in the healthcare field if they can, whether it's medical assistant, whether it's mm-hmm. shadowing someone, um, whether it's working as a phlebotomist, I think any contact that you have with a patient for you to understand that concept is always helpful. And the school always like to see that. I'm working with PAs for Latino health. Mm -hmm. And so as part of that, we've talked to several schools to find out what do pre-PAs need to have a better chance of getting into school. And that's one thing that they talk about, that having that Clinical exposure is not mandatory, but it does make them a better candidate for them. Yeah, thank you for for bringing that up because that's something that I talk about almost on every single episode is go get experience. Even if it's just shadowing, everybody is usually more than happy and open their doors for for an hour, you know, go, go small. Sometimes they allow you to do more. If you can do an internship, there's lots of opportunities. And and that's a great way to expose yourself and get that experience. Doing your master's in PA, you're basically being taught in all areas. But then once you graduate, you can pick your specialty. Is that correct? That's correct. So when I um, when I graduated, I ended up starting with internal medicine. And a little bit of occupational medicine because the doctor that I worked with was also the medical director for the fire department in Long Island. And so we would do a lot of the firefighter physicals and their mass testing and all that stuff. And so I got some occupational uh, experience when I moved to Florida. Um, I did family practice there. And then in 2007 um, is when I started um, looking at Texas. Again, just kind of was moving just because of family reasons. We were just kind of moving into a different direction than Florida. And so I just happened to put my name out there with a headhunter and they happened to get me into MD Anderson for some interviews there. And I'm like, I never saw myself in oncology in any way, but um, I was like, okay, well, it's the endocrine department. I can go do their diabetes. I can handle their thyroid patients. So (laughs) in my mind, that's all I was thinking. I'm like, I'll handle their hypothyroidism. I'll get their diabetes on check. No worries. And then they can handle the oncology side. And it wasn't like that. I got MD Anderson came and brought me over so that I could uh, interview. And I interviewed with several of the departments, um, GI medical oncology, endocrine oncology. I remember head and neck had also interviewing like several ones. I'm like, I didn't even know I was interviewing with all of those departments. They just kind of like, here, you're going to just meet people. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. But I ended up with endocrine and oncology and I got to see like thyroid cancer and pituitary tumors and adrenal tumors and things that you, you you obviously see in school, but you think, oh, those are the zebras. Those are the things you hardly ever see. But at Anderson, you see them a lot. Um, I enjoyed it. And so I, it led to me wanting to learn more. And so the great thing about, again, our profession is that I was like, you know what? I hardly got enough experience of radiation oncology. It's not something that our schools focus a lot on mm. unless you do an oncology fellowship, which nowadays they do have a lot more of. So I switched departments and I went to go work in radiation oncology and I immersed myself in everything, technology, technique, understanding of what radiation was. And it only kind of piqued my interest even more. And I'm like, okay, well, I've done oncology, like medical oncology. I want to go try radiation let's go to surgical world and so I went and moved over to GI surgical oncology and there I learned about colon cancer some liver cancer and pancreatic cancer and all the different gastric cancer esophageal and so you again the variety of just being able to not have to go back to school for that but just literally the job and your peers and your physicians are essentially training you in the process and you become this micro ingrained like pseudo specialist because you see it every day and you have great minds working alongside you like teaching you and guiding you on the way and you go to conferences and you learn more and that's how you expand the role um and now I'm in breast medical oncology so again I you know three four months ago I'm like you know what I'm saturated of the surgical oncology world I'm ready for a change I want to see something different and so that was quite unique for my department where I'm at where they're like most of the APP stay in their own department like I want something different yeah. and uh, breast medical oncology said, okay, we'll take you. And and so the past four months I've been doing breast medical oncology and I love it. It, it. 
it gave me a new passion because it's something new to me and I'm having to really push my brain, push my boundaries and learn and a new patient cohort because it's a female-based cohort for the most part mm-hmm. uh, of patient ex- um, you know, volume. And so it's, it's definitely unique. And that's what I love about our profession that you really get to choose that if tomorrow I decided, you know what, oncology is just not for me. Like I can go back to family practice or I can go to pediatrics or ER. It's not as easy, but we have enough of medical knowledge that you can, you can do it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That that's awesome. Especially if you start in one specific specialty and you want to move, then you have that opportunity without having to go back to school like most other careers do. Right. Right. Very, very cool. So what do you um, attribute your success? So you were a um, first gen you know, here in the States and English was not your first language. You've, you've gone to school, not just that you've finished a very competitive program. What do you, what do you attribute your success to? I think it's almost like you want to thank your parents for the hardship and the struggle that they went through, right? You want to you want to do better than than what they could because that's what they want for you, right? So it's almost kind of like that. You don't want to fail. You want to make sure that you do the best you can, that you grow. And so I think it's more as a way of thanking your parents and your your ancestors for where you are right now. And then also showing that to your kids, like showing being an example, not only to your kids, to your family. I was the first one to graduate in my family from college. Um, yeah. And I'm proud of that, right? And so I think being a leader in that aspect and showing other Latinos in our community, that it can be done. Like, it's not easy. It's never going to be, you know, handed to you. But if you work hard and you push yourself, it can be done. And, and people are willing to come help you and push you along the way. And if someone is interested in learning more about PA, um, where would you where would you guide them to be a first stop to start learning more in depth about this career? Absolutely. So the American Academy of Physician Assistants or now Physician Associates, which is something else that I think we should talk about at some point, um, mm-hmm. is national uh, organization for physician assistants. And they have a wealth of information on their website um, that talks about what the profession is in both English and Spanish. So if you have parents that, you know, want to understand what this is all about, they do have that in Spanish as well. Um, And then the PAEA um, also has a lot of information about PA programs throughout the U.S. that are available um, and can guide a whole lot more on prereqs and what's needed per school. Um, so going back to what I said, I think that's a great website um, and just kind of tagging onto that whole title thing. So we have been mm-hmm. called physician assistants for quite a long time, but prior to being called physician assistants, we were actually physician associates. And um, it was through oh. some political advocacy things that happened back in the late 70s, early 80s, our name changed back then. But about two years ago, the Academy voted to switch it back to Physician Associates because we feel that that really um, aligns more to what we do. I think Mm -hmm. it diminishes some of the confusion that happens with the Physician Assistant to Medical Assistant title. Mm -hmm. Um, In Spanish, it would be Asociado Medico, not Medico Asistente, which is Mm -hmm. a lot of the times what they try to say. Um, and so that's been a change that has not been incorporated into our profession. And now it is up to the state um, licensure to change the title as well. So every state PA organization, because there are state organizations that represent us as well, aside from the overall AAPA, um, is in charge of now going back to the Texas um, Capitol Hill, essentially, in the Texas Medical Board to have that name change take place. And so once the state recognizes the title change, then the physician assistant can start calling themselves to a patient physician associate in clinic. But essentially in a non-clinical world, like if I go to do a presentation somewhere, I'm a physician associate. If I'm introducing myself to a patient, I'm a physician assistant until Texas law acknowledges our title change. People that are considering the career 
know about that little technicality that we are actively advocating for um, because we feel it really does encompass our profession better. Um, and it's not in increasing our scope of practice. It's not because we're not trying to be, you know, collaborating with our physicians. We just feel that that aligns more to what we do. And it takes away that misconception and, and kind of miscommunication that you hear sometimes with the title. I love it. And I highly support that. And I hope that changes because I think that will open a lot of more doors for other students as well, because it gets overlooked. You know, they think, well, I don't want to be a medical assistant. I, you know, either I want to be a nurse practitioner or I want to be a doctor. And they skip that opportunity that's right there. Absolutely. And I, and I think nurse practitioners and um, PAs, you know, at Anderson, we work side by side. We are all working together. We have essentially the same duties. Um, we're under a different licensing board. Essentially, they're under the nursing board. We're under the Texas Medical Board. Um, but in practice, we all work collaboratively side by side. The only delineation that's a little slightly different um, is that some uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, unless they go back and do an additional certification in surgical assisting, they cannot be in the OR. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, that's one that's one of the difference that PAs, once we come out of PA school, we because we do surgical rotations. Like I had to do amputations, we did C-sections, we did mastectomies. We did a lot of different things when I was in practice. Um, we come already with that experience and that's something that on the nursing side, they don't see unless they do this extra step. And um, I know you're actively involved with the physician assistant uh, for Latino health. So give us a high level overview of that organization. Right. So what we are is um, PAs for Latino health or physician associates for Latino health. Um, our mission is on expanding diversity within our profession because there's not enough Latino providers in general for our community, whether it's physicians and PSPAs. We need more of us out there. Our patients need us. They need someone that they can relate to, that they can culturally assimilate to. And so that's a big focus of ours. Our mission is also to educate providers about the healthcare inequities and adversities that our Latino community faces so that they're more aware of that. We also want to advocate for the profession and, and make sure that we're able to reach a greater community. Um, you know, the more abilities that PAs have, the greater we can reach rural communities, which a lot of the times is our Latino patients, right? Uh, reach of mine or kind of just passion of mine has been the farm worker community. There's a lot of healthcare inequities there. There's a lot of pesticide exposure and illnesses that arise from just everyday work life that they're exposed to and that they bring home to their families and their families are affected. So people don't always think about that when they're in clinical practice. I know for a fact that many of my peers, they're working in Houston. They don't necessarily think of farm workers. It's not just Latinos, obviously, but making that awareness for it. And that's what PS Latinos for Latino Health tries to do is to bring some of that awareness. So we do monthly uh, medical, medical education sessions and we actually have scholarships. So one of the things that we're very proud of is in combined with the NIH, the AAPA, the National Hispanic Medical Association and our organization, PAs for Latino Health, we uh, work with Canopy Medical Spanish program. And so what they have is this like three-step program where if someone goes, as a, as a physician, anyone really, um, and takes their medical Spanish program and they buy the program, um, one, they get a discount if they come through us, but that discount then, the part of the funds actually come back to the PA foundation, specifically to PAs for Latino health. Mm -hmm. And then we take those funds and we're able to then give out scholarships to PA students. And so last year, we were able to give over $15,000 in scholarships to PA students. Um, and it's because of that effort. So we're not only helping providers learn the medical Spanish that they need to speak to their patients, but as a resource, we are now able to then take some of those funds and give them right back to the community, to the PA students, so that they can be part of the community and give back to the Latino community and be able to communicate with that community. I love that. And for, for our audience, let me just say, um, even our bilingual population, uh, when they're fluent in both languages, if Spanish is their primary language, when it comes to healthcare, that's what they want to speak. That's the language they feel comfortable speaking. 
in and addressing any medical concerns. Absolutely. Like my dad, I was talking to the other day, you know, he's a bilingual. He's been here over 30 years. Um, but you ask him to go to the doctor and of course he comes to me, he's like, Paola, go help me find my specialist, but make sure they speak Spanish because you yeah. know that if I go there, the doctor's going to be talking to me in English and I'm going to be nodding my head the whole time. And then I'm going to come up from the meeting and forget everything that they said. And then if I come to try to tell you what they said, I'm not going to be able to understand. So mm -hmm. what is that happening? He calls me on, on the phone. He asked me on speakerphone listening to the doctor. <laughs> Because he really, truly feels way more comfortable in Spanish. He feels that he can trust that provider more, like he can engage that provider yeah. more. And so we're always looking like for his primary care to be someone that speaks Spanish. He's diabetic. So for his endocrinologist, thankfully, we found someone that speaks Spanish. So that makes a huge difference to adherence, to treatment, to listening, to what we're asking the patient to do. Um, and I've seen it even in oncology. I had a patient once that had seen a provider that used a translator. And again, MD Anderson has great translators. But the patient got to me and they were like, not sure if they wanted to do their cancer treatment. And I'm like, but why? It's like, I don't know. My husband had lung cancer and they got chemo and he died. And so they, in their mind, the moment they got chemo, that's what caused them to die. And it wasn't like that. So I, I sat there for an hour and a half talking to them in Spanish. I wasn't even there for that reason. I was there to help them with their port for their chemo treatment that they were supposed to then start their treatment. And I sat there for about an hour and a half, just talking to them, explaining to them that, you know, you know, your cancer is different from your husband's cancer. This treatment is different. You're going to tolerate it better. This is your best chance of treatment. And just talking to them in Spanish, like the whole family was on speakerphone listening because they're from the valley yeah um and it made a huge difference and the patient proceeded with treatment and it was just because they felt like okay all my fears are gone as latinos we trust the doctor but at the same time we're scared of all this stuff that we don't understand mm -hmm. so as pas i will say that's one thing that we can do because we have a little bit more time to spend with the patient i can't spend that hour with them and I can educate them and I can explain it to them in their terms and in their language. And that's huge. And that's something that I, I ended up taking the certification course so that I can speak to my patients in Spanish. And MD Anderson allows that because they've tested my fluency to make sure that I can speak to them one-on-one -on -one without having to have a translator there in between, which is what was happening before. And, and we won't even get started with patient compliance, how that can increase dramatically. Yeah. <laughs> Just speaking the same language. Oh my goodness! Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, let let's let's end on something a little bit more more lighthearted. Why don't you share with us a favorite song, a playlist, uh, your favorite book? What is it that you like the most that you could share with oh, us? Goodness. Um. So I love books. I am in three different book clubs. <laughs> favorite like. Book clubs is my Pelatinos book club, which I'm a Peloton avid, you know, exercise fiend. And so there is this subgroup called Pelatinos and they <sighs> created a book. And I will have to say that to me, that book club has been amazing because they have introduced me to so many different um, genres of Latino writers. Um, and it's been amazing. So I think that's definitely one thing I said, but as far as music, Okay, so I love Mana. I just see, silly saw them in concert. So anything Mana, oh my goodness, gets to my heart. And Carlos Vives from my Colombia roots. Oh. I, mean, I can't wait to see him for the third time in the same Smart Financial Center. I'm like, yes, I am there. So that I would say would be my two passions. I love it. Oh, man. Thank you so much again for spending this time with us. Um, for our audience, I'm going to be having all the links on our show notes. Where can you find the show notes? Just right where you're listening us from. Look down below. You're going to find the links to what she shared as well as the opportunities for, for scholarship that she had mentioned. And hopefully in upcoming episodes, we'll have a little bit more on scholarship opportunities for students because I think that is another misconception we hear from students is, my family does not have the money. And so, you know, we definitely want to bridge that gap. So thank you, Paola, for being here with us. I appreciate your time. And hopefully um, this was a, a great opportunity for others to learn about being a physician associate.
Thank you so much for the time. If there's any students out there that are interested, please reach out. I'm happy to talk one-on-one -on -one if needed. Um, I'm always passionate about our profession and obviously helping push the next leaders forward. Thank you, Paola. And I'll have her contact information below. And so thank you very much. And we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the College and Career Ready podcast. We hope you found the discussion enlightening and inspiring. Before we go, I have a special request for you. If you enjoyed today's episode and believe it can make a difference in someone else's life, I encourage you to share it with a friend or classmate. By spreading the knowledge and insights we've shared here, you can help others on their college and career journeys. So take a moment to think of someone who would benefit from this podcast. Maybe it's a friend who's struggling with choosing a major or a classmate who needs a little nudge of encouragement. Reach out to them and let them know about this resource. Together, we can empower each other to achieve success. Remember, you can share the College and Career Ready podcast through word of mouth, social media, messaging apps, or even a simple text or email. The choice is yours, and the impact you can make is immense. Keep dreaming, my friends. Stay present and stay well. Remember, together we can achieve anything. I love you and I'm always cheering for you. Talk to you soon. Hi, friend. Thank you for listening in. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean so much to me if you share it with a friend. Share it with them right now or even better. Tag me so I can personally thank you for helping us build our community. I'm so thankful for each and every one of you. Let's keep in touch and I'll talk to you soon. Adios.